Around 1870, the German logician George Cantor began developing a theory with a rather humble goal, provide a foundation for all of mathematics. This was the set theory, but what he did not expect was that this theory harbored a serious problem. The foundations of mathematics were under serious threat, and that is the topic of today's video. So, sit tight, because here comes a story. Hey, Pedro here. This video you are watching was originally in Portuguese, my native language. This is the attempt of our team to translate it to English, and I sincerely hope you enjoy it. Your feedback is extremely important to us. Now, back to the video. Cantor's idea begins when he tries to establish some elementary principles, which we call axioms. Axioms are, in essence, fundamentally concepts without proof, which we take as true beforehand. They serve as a kind of starting point that we can consider safe or even often obvious, like saying that I am equal to myself. And we can either accept or reject these axioms. Depending on what we accept, we can obtain or derive very different things. Since the theory that Cantor was trying to formulate was about sets, it makes sense that the first thing he had to define was what a set is. And believe me, this task is not as simple as it seems. If I asked you what sets are, many of you would answer that sets are actually collections of objects or things. However, it is mathematics and philosophy that we are dealing with here. Or rather, what Cantor was dealing with in 1870. We need a more precise and rigorous definition. There is a positive side so far. The idea of sets is quite intuitive, and in a way, we can say that it has existed since we started counting and grouping things. I can even go further and say that we can make a set of anything we can actually think of or refer to, such as, for example, the set that has only you as a member, also known as the text message group, to remind you to do things later. Or the set of yellow things that include sunflowers, bananas, taxis, Spongebob Squarepants and many, many other things. Or perhaps the set of all natural numbers greater than a thousand, which would be infinite. The idea is that sets can be large or small, as well as infinite or empty. We can define a set by extensively listing all the objects it contains. But imagine how laborious it would be to list the set of all the stars in the sky, or worse, to list infinite sets, which would actually be impossible. Therefore, we can define sets in a better way, using only properties, without any limit on what they would be. At least for now. For example, the property of something being a circular object, the property of something being over 10 centimeters, or even the property of something being a Dutch person who lived to 37, who painted and who cut off part of their own ear. We can choose properties that are either very specific or very vague. This is the idea behind one of the most important axioms of set theory in Genoa, the axiom of unrestricted comprehension. Don't be intimidated by the complicated name because the idea is simple. Given any property P, there exists the set of objects that have this property. For the curious, putting this idea in logical terms, we would have something like what is appearing on the screen. In other words, there exists a set X for everything Y such that Y belongs to X if and only if Y has the property P, with X being the set of all things Y that possess the property P. Don't fry your brain, as I'm going to explain it in another way. Describe the set of all European countries as every X, such that X is a country in Europe. Portugal, Spain, Germany, France, and all the other 46 countries. And, besides this axiom, there were other ideas, such as the notion that sets with the same elements must be equal. In other words, the set that has the second planet of the solar system, the morning star, and the evening star, is equal to the set that contains only Venus, since they are just different names for the same thing. Furthermore, the order of components within the set does not matter, so the set consisting of, for instance, cat and dog is equal to the set dog and cat. And it also doesn't matter if the elements are repeated, because the set cat and cat is equal to the set cat. So, let's suppose that I will call the set containing cats and dogs A. So, if we want to take only the elements of A that are animals that bark, we would have a new set made up, for example, only of dogs, which is what we call a subset of A, and we can also make sets that have other sets as part of them. For instance, a set that comprises the set of animals and the set of flowers. The point is that sets can be constructed in many ways. We can even have sets that are encompassed within themselves. For example, does the set of all cats contain itself? In other words, is the set of all cats itself a cat? 
No, because sets are mathematical objects and not furry animals that meow, right? And does the set of all things that are not turtles contain itself? Yes, because sets are definitely not turtles. But does the set of all non-empty sets absolutely contain itself? In other words, essentially, is the set of all non-empty sets in fact itself non-empty? Well, it seems so, since there are many non-empty sets, like the set of stars in the sky. In other words, essentially, the set of all non-empty sets has several different elements, and therefore, it is not empty. These were some ideas from the naive set theory that Cantor was developing. He actually thought that there would be a set for any property that we could create. And this is where two more important figures in the story come in. Bertrand Russell and Gottlob Frege. Frege was also a German logician, and like Cantor, he was in search of the foundations of mathematics, more precisely arithmetic. But he aimed a bit higher. He wanted to show that all fundamental arithmetic could be derived from logic and a bit of set theory, and nothing more. And this great project of his life was called logicism, and his theory depended on the proper functioning of set theory. And this is where Russell comes into the story. Russell looked at all this and thought, well, if sets can contain themselves, and I can actually construct a set from any property, then imagine a set formed by all the sets that do not contain themselves. This set of all sets that do not contain themselves would have many members. For example, the set of all cats, the set of all flowers, the empty set, and many more. Russell's devastating question was the following. Does this set, composed of all sets that do not actually contain themselves, contain itself? Russell was amazing for asking this type of question. I will call this set R. We will define it as follows. R is the set of all sets X such that X does not belong to X. Then we have two cases. Either R belongs to R, or R does not belong to R. In the first case, if R belongs to R, then, by our definition, to be inside the set, it needs to have the property of not belonging to R. So, it is clear that we have that if R belongs to R, then R does not belong to R. In the second case, if R does not belong to R, then it fulfills the property that defines the set. Thus, it is a member of the set, and once again, is part of itself. In other words, if R does not belong to R, then R must belong to R. But these two conclusions are contradictory. We have that R belongs to R only if it does not belong to R, and vice versa. And here you might blow your mind, because that's exactly the idea. This is the famous Russell's paradox. And if you don't understand it, don't worry. The conclusion is paradoxical. The idea is the same as other self-referential paradoxes, those that refer to themselves such as the Barber paradox or the Liar paradox. Then, around 1902, when Frege was about to publish his book Basic Laws of Arithmetic, the result of all his work and his ambitious logicism project, Russell sent a letter explaining the paradox. And this would make Frege's theory collapse. But even so, Frege honored his commitment to the truth and added an appendix at the beginning of his book where he presented Russell's paradox, warning that the entire theory proposed in that book had a fundamental problem. It's an honorable attitude, we have to be honest. In this era, especially on X, people pretend they are always right. But things didn't end there. Mathematics still needed a foundation, and various solutions were quickly suggested. If we have the freedom to create axioms, we also have the freedom to destroy or modify them, and it was from this that solutions to the paradox emerged. One of them was made in the zermelo frankel set theory, known as ZFC, and widely used in logic and mathematics. Their idea was to essentially restrict the comprehension axiom, which, in essence, defined a set from another set defined by any property. They specifically added a new axiom, called regularity, in which sets were not able to belong to themselves, and thus, the paradox could not be derived. Everything was fine, the foundations of mathematics were saved, but only until the mid-1930s, when Kurt Gödel came up with a problem that is still one of the great limitations of mathematics today. And not just that. It was what changed the course of a world war and enabled the development of computers. But that's a story for another day. This is the kind of video that we probably have to watch more than once to fully understand its meaning. But Russell's paradox is a very beautiful example of how an idea, when very well executed with words, can make our best theories fall apart. And that's how science and knowledge advance. And to conclude the video, I would like to leave you with a special task. 
try to imagine a color that doesn't exist. Thank you very much, and see you next time.